As the sun went up today in the morning, 7.4 billion people woke up to a new day. How many of you got out of the bed, took a shower, made a cup of tea or coffee, brushed your teeth, um, grabbed a bottle of water on the way here? Probably many of you. Those are the daily habits we're used to. We take them for granted without a second thought. But what if that's not the case for over a billion people in the world? So just stop for a minute or two and think how, how easy the life is for us, the lucky ones, and how terribly complicated it is for over a billion people for whom the clean, accessible water is just not an option. Those people have to spend 40 billion hours every year to collect water. Some water sources are really far, and people, mostly women and children, have to walk miles away from their homes to deliver water for their families. To put in this perspective, 40 billion hours is equivalent to the labor force of the entire United Kingdom. Imagine what those people could have done if, if they wouldn't need to care about delivering water. Imagine how much they could have done for their families, for their society, and for the, even for ec economies of their countries. So, I am a member and uh, vice president of engineers, engineers Without Borders chapter. Probably many of you know what, what this organization is doing. But basically, it goes to third world countries to do some engineering projects for them. And they commonly do water irrigation projects. And one of the times uh, we went to do a project, um, I was just there after a day, tired. I got my bottle of water, started drinking. And I saw this small child who was really thirsty, and he was looking at me drinking this water. Of course, I gave it to him, and I saw how grateful he was. So when I came back, I started thinking about it, how I could help those people. At first, I thought maybe we could just, you know, buy a lot of bottles of water and get it sent to there. But then, some other day, I was sitting and drinking in the iced tea outside, and I saw drops of water forming on the sides of the cup. And I realized, why do we need to have this water shipped all across the world if it ma almost magically appears in front of me on the sides of this glass. So then I started doing the research, and then I found uh, this really interesting, interesting creature. It's a bug that lives, lives in the Namib Desert, one of the driest areas in the world. And the only way this bug is able to survive, every morning when it's cold, it, gets to the high, it finds the highest point it can find in the desert and stands on its head. The water from, from, the, from the dew condenses on its back. It slides directly to its mouth. It's one of the many great inventions that were, create, uh, they were inspired by nature. Um, so I started doing research and looking up at how I can manufacture a way of, of, of doing this on a large scale. And so about a year, a year later, I've been in, I got in touch with many of the professors, and this was this time I started my education at university, and I was surprised by how many, how many professors got interested by my idea and they supported me, and together with engineering, Engineers Without Borders, I was able to build my device, and it's, it's been successfully working in a couple of the regions such as El Salvador and Mexico. Uh, so, let me explain how it works. I know it might sound complicated and magical. How are you making water out of air? Or how is it even, how is it even possible? So basically, air around us always contains some amount of water vapors. Ability of air to hold this water mostly depends on the temperature. So if the temperature drops, the air loses its ability to hold water, and this water condenses either as, as a fog or as a dew. So the only thing to get water out of air is we need, to, we need to just cool it down. But then you would ask, how would you, how would you cool it down? Um, I actually, it took me a couple months to think of this problem. I had a lot of different approaches. Uh, and some, some, some of them were terrific, from um, liquid nitrogen to nuclear reactions. But then I finally realized that the Earth could do it for us, just simply the ground on which, which I stand. So, uh, it actually came to me, this idea came to me one day when I was doing gardening with my dad, and we were plants, planting 
uh, the bush, and then I realized that the ground is actually really cold. So I dig the hole even, even deeper, and I took a couple of the home thermometers, which people usually use to when, they, when they're sick, and I put them inside the ground on di different levels, and then I figured that even six, seven feet under the ground, the earth, the temperature stays constant around 45, 50 degrees, which is more than enough uh, for, for, for the dew to condense. So the only problem was to, to engineer the right, the, the right system that would be able to bring this cold temperature up to the ground where we can, use, where we can cool down the atmospheric air to, to, uh, to get the water condensed. So um, here you can see the di diagram of my device. So there is an underground and the uh, ground part. The underground part is really simple. It's just a uh, heat exchange coil. The, the heat travels only from hot to cold, so it actually lets the heat escape to the ground. So, and the ground part consists of the, another heat exchange coil that will turn cold and actually on which the, uh, the water will condense. And it also consists of the solar panel, a small solar panel that powers a small electric turbine that draws the air to, to, to this coil, and then the water condenses on this coil, and then the cool air escapes. And all the water goes down to reservoir, and then this water is completely drinkable. Um, regardless of the air quality, this water could be could be used for both irrigation, drinking, anything. It could be used pretty much anywhere in the world. So initially, I thought, this is a great device, and it fits the purpose of engineers borders perfectly, because the third world countries need it. Here are the, all the countries that are affected by this. All the sub-Saharan uh, countries in Africa, not only Africa, it's South America, India, um, a lot of countries. But then I actually realized that this problem is very important, not only in countries that are commonly associated with it, but also in my, in my home, in California, which, which is the, one of the most technologically developed areas. Here you can see, I've been living in California for the last five years, and see what, what it has done to my, to, to what, what, what the drought has done to, to my home. All the rivers are being, uh, being dried up. What if you can just make the water and uh, help, help to solve this crisis. I was really, really impressed by how such a small thing such as iced tea made me come up with su such a big thing that helps so many people. And after we installed them in uh, several countries, I got a lot of feedback from those people. And there was nothing better than knowing that something which was simple to you and you did it helps so many people. I have not reinvented the wheel. People have been condensing water ink for a long time, but most of the devices are really inefficient. They require a lot of energy and main maintenance. But what I'm proposing is a simple solution that could change the life of very many people. You don't need, you don't need to do something as big as a wheel to, to change the world. If it's something small, which could be inspired by, like me, by, I was inspired by tea, by, an, by a cup of iced tea, to do a really great thing for many people, and all of you are capable of doing that.